Um, but anyway, as for Jehovah's Witnesses, um, a few things that you should know. Uh, I became, first of all, just some background about me. I became a Christian at 12 years old, and by 15 years old, I was hunting down Jehovah's Witnesses. By 16, I was actually going into kingdom halls to find them because I wanted somebody, I wanted to talk to them. Uh, and so I, I've spent a lot of time talking to Jehovah's Witnesses. I've attended their services, and by the way, they can't worship. Uh, it, it's bizarre, but when you go into their service and actually hear them worship, there's nothing, I don't think they feel very worshipful, frankly. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, they're strange, it's a strange group of people, but one of the things is, of course, I, I want you, we all need to be winsome. I'm not going to talk a lot about being winsome, being nice to them, not being harsh or angry in the way you present yourself. I think that's a given, right? I mean, we know that already, that we should be that way, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that or really anymore. I will say this, though, just because you are winsome, just because you did the job right, does not by any stretch of the imagination mean that they're not going to get mad at you. Because there's a lot of confusion in the Christian community about that. I would remind you that Jesus, uh, when he was, what do you think he was doing with the Pharisees? He was arguing, right? That was argument. In fact, they tried to push him off of a cliff and they finally crucified him. They didn't like what he said. The scripture says that Paul argued every day in the temple. They stoned Paul. Uh, they, they beat him. Uh, he started, because of his preaching, a riot was started in Ephesus. So you say, was Paul and Jesus, were they not doing the job right? Well, I think they were. And I say, WWJD, we need, to be, we need to be winsome. Yes, we need to be kind and gentle towards those we're preaching to. But do not be confused that just because they get angry, you've done something wrong because that just isn't the case. There are a lot of ways to approach cults like the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, you, one of the best way, things to do is to bring them in and chat with them once a week. Uh, that's a good thing to do, of course. Uh, keep inviting them back. The trouble with that is two things. One, it takes a lot of time, and I don't suspect that many of you, at least in, this, in the first part of your life, are really going to have the time to just keep inviting uh, a bunch of cultists back to your living room uh, every week. I've done that. Uh, and it does take a lot of time. The other thing, though, that it takes is it takes a lot of knowledge about all of their doctrines. Because if you're going to have them in every week, certainly you're going to talk about more than just uh, one or two doctrines. They're going to sooner or later want to say, well, what about this and what about that? And so it requires you, if you're going to really spend a lot of time with them, to be well-versed in many, many doctrines. And I don't, as I said, I don't think that most of us will have the time to do that. And, or even have the knowledge base to really be that skilled in dealing just with Jehovah's Witnesses. So I'm going to give you a way of dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses today that is, frankly, uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat aggressive. Uh, and uh, I'm, of course, again, be nice. I learned this from a former Jehovah's Witness named Bill Setner. He was the one that uh, was teaching in a class that I heard this on, and I thought it was a tremendous approach, and I've used it ever since. And so when the Jehovah's Witnesses come to my door, here's what I say. I say something just like this. I say, now, uh, look, I'm glad you're here, but I, and I'm going to just ask you one question. And after you've answered my one question, then I'll answer any question you want once you've answered my question. And of course, they're salivating right off the bat. I mean, they're, they're as happy as a pig at a trough at the idea, you're only gonna ask me one question and then you, we can ask you any question we want. That's right, that, you can do that. Uh, but first, as I get into this question, let me clarify a few things. And by the way, this approach avoids scripture tag, and I'll talk maybe a little bit more about that in a minute. It avoids bouncing uh, around as they keep asking you one question after another when they realize that they haven't gotten traction. So as I begin to clarify, I'll say something like this. So we know in your translation, and I'll quote it out of their translation, in John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. That's the way their translation puts it. The Word was a God. And so let me quote one more verse. Isaiah 9.6, this is again out of the New World Translation. It says, for unto us a child has been born, uh, there has been a son given to us, and the princely rule will come upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Uh, so now that I've just given a couple of scriptures to just begin the conversation or to think about, I'll say, now let me clarify. Jehovah equals Almighty God. Is that right? Jehovah equals 
Almighty God, and they're, yes, that's right. Jehovah is Almighty God. It, he, is, he is the only Almighty God. And I'll say, now, and Jesus isn't Jehovah, right? And they'll go, no, Jesus isn't Jehovah. And they're really thinking, I've, I, I'm on their side. And I'll say, now, Jesus is a mighty God. Isn't that correct? Jesus is a mighty God. He's not Jehovah, right? He's a mighty God by your view. That's what your scriptures just said in the two verses we read. That he, and the word was a God, and then it says a be called wonderful counselor, mighty God. So Jesus is a mighty God, but he's not almighty God Jehovah. Isn't that correct? And they'll say, oh yeah, that's, that, you've got that exactly right. Jesus isn't Jehovah, he's a mighty God. Jehovah's almighty God. And then I'll say, now, uh, now Jehovah is, a, is Jehovah a true God or a false God? And they'll say, uh, Jehovah is a true God, of course. Well, that, duh, he better be a true God. And then I'll say, okay, uh, but is Jesus a true God or a false God? And this, usually they'll pause right there for a moment. They'll go, um, he's a true God. Well, of course, I've never heard them say he was a false God. If, that would be untenable, right? To say, I think Jesus is a false God. I mean, the scripture speaks very highly of him being a mighty God. And, you know, I mean, Jesus obviously is a true God. But they'll pause on that because I think they begin to suspect there's going to be problems, and indeed there are. And so then I'll say, well, um, it's, uh, so here's my question. Uh, how can you believe if, Jesus, if Jehovah is a true almighty, is true almighty God and Jesus is true a mighty God, uh, you have two true gods. But the scripture says you can ha- only have one God. How do you justify that? And that's where the wheels, frankly, begin to come off uh, the wagon. Because, and I'll point out, in their translation again, the New World Translation says, before me no God was formed, neither shall there be any after me. So, so there you have it again. Before me, no God is formed. I, should, I didn't quote it quite right. It says, and after me, there continued to be none. There's no other gods. In Isaiah 44, 6, their translation says, I am the first and I am the last, and besides me, there is no God. And that puts them in a very awkward position. By the way, at this point, I might say, well, you know, you guys are polytheists. And they certainly do not like the idea that they're polytheists, and I'll talk about that more in just a moment. But so they will then respond, and I'm going to give you the kinds of responses so that you just can have these in your mind. Like I say, you can find all of this on my blog, claydjones.net, but one of the responses I'll give is, oh, well, this is a capital G God. Before me, uh, besides me, there is no capital G God. Well, of course, I'll point out to that that the Hebrew doesn't have capitals. There's no capitals in Hebrew. That's the first problem with that. Uh, and so the, the, tr- the New World uh, Translators, uh, the New World Translators have put a, G, a capital G in there. But what are they trying to say? Why are they, why are they doing that? Because they're trying to say, by, by capitalizing the G in that God, there is no God besides me. They're trying to say there's no almighty God beside me because that's exactly what they want to say. There, there's other, other gods but there's only one almighty God. The trouble is, very simply, that the Hebrew doesn't say that. The Hebrew doesn't teach that. It just simply says, there is no God besides me. That's all it says, there is no God besides me. Now, if indeed, if if the Lord through the Holy Spirit had had Isaiah insert the word almighty, and it said, there is no almighty God before me, and every time uh, that that it said there's no God beside me or there's no other gods, every time it said that, uh, the Holy Spirit had encouraged the writers to say there are no other almighty gods. Well, if that were the case, then the Jehovah's Witnesses would be able to make a good point. But those verses don't say that. They're they're having to alter the text uh, to make it sound like there are no other gods. And so once I point that out to them, they'll usually say, well, we only worship one God. I'll say, in fact, one day they came to my door, and my wife, who is never at the door with me when the Jehovah's Witnesses come by, some, for some reason she was, and I put my arm around my wife, and I said, if I only loved, if I was married to two women, but I only uh, loved one of them, I'd still be a polygamist. And the fact that you believe there are more than one God in the universe, even though you only worship one of them, still makes you a polytheist. And, of course, they're not too happy about that, and they'll reply something like this. They'll say, well, the Bible calls Satan a God. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, it says, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel 
of the Christ who is the image of God. Notice it says, the God of this world. And they'll say, well, so Satan is a God though, isn't he? And I'll ask, is Satan a true God or a false God? And they know this one immediately. They say he's a false God. And they'll say, well, you still have two true gods. You still count them, one, two. Sometimes, by the way, I've even written it down. I'll say, I've actually written it down on a piece of paper for emphasis. I'll go, Jesus, before I get into it, Jesus equals a mighty God, a mighty, and then I'll put the word true in there. Jehovah equals a, or almighty God, a true almighty God. And I'll go, and I've pointed to the paper, I'll go, go count them, one, two. You're a polytheist. No, 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 we only worship one of them. If I only loved one of my two wives, I'd still be a polygamist. One, two, one, two, you have two gods. They, at this point, of course, they're getting a little bit agitated. That's okay with me, by the way, as I mentioned at the outset. I'm okay if they get a little bit agitated. When you proclaim truth to people that are believing falsehood, they're going to get a little agitated. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't trouble me at all. Um, like I say, I still want to be nice, and I am nice, and I'm friendly and smiling, and, and I think when they walk away, they don't go, he's not a nice guy, but they still don't like talking to me, you understand. But I don't think they're walking away thinking, he wasn't, they didn't walk away and say, oh, Clay's rude to me, or, you know, he was, he was just one of those just hard, get along hard Christians that don't have any compassion or sympathy. Not at all. I was nice to them, but I just, anyway, I just keep going, and then, then they'll say something like this, well... The scripture says in uh, Exodus 4.16 that Moses will serve as a god to Pharaoh. See, so there you have Moses is now called a god. And my response to that, the response is actually very simple. Uh, When the scripture says that that Moses will serve as god to Pharaoh, that Moses will serve as god to Pharaoh, that's different, isn't it? Some of the translations will say you will be, that Moses will be like God. Do you see the difference between saying someone will be as a god or like a god to Pharaoh, that there's something different than, about that, isn't there, than saying, and Mo- Moses will be god to Pharaoh. For instance, if I said uh, there was an older woman and I said she's like a mother to me, unless I'm actually talking about the woman who gave me birth, if I'm talking about another woman, I don't mean when I say she's like a mother to me that she actually gave birth to me. You understand? There's a big difference in saying something is as a God or like a God and saying that this uh, actually being is actually God, that Moses is going to be God. Uh, and then they'll reply something like this. Well, the word God is just a title that can be used to, uh, for those who are on the side of God. It's just a title for those used on the side of God. And so then I reply, well, then you have lots of gods. Then in your way of thinking, then there's lots of true gods. Uh, does that, how does that work, though? Because the scripture says, now I'm just out of a normal translation, it says, before me no God was formed, and neither shall there be any after me. But now you're telling me that that verse is somehow incorrect. So I, how do you justify these things? Uh, then they'll say something like this. Again, it's interesting, because they'll go back and they'll start to recycle. Yeah, but I, again, we only worship one God. I'm not talking about who you worship. You believe, look it up. I, one time I even got a dictionary out and said, look at the word polytheist. Isn't this, it says, it does say who worships a God, but it's not just who worships a God, it's one who believes there are other, there's more than one God in the universe. That's what it means to be a polytheist. Are you not a polytheist? It's like, no, no, we're not polytheists. Well, you have two true gods, let's count them together. One, two. That's two, right? This is one, this is another, one, two. This is two true gods. You have two true gods. Oh, no, we're, you know, that's, that's not right. We only worship one God. And again, I keep saying, I'm not asking how many gods you worship. And now I start using a little bit of logic on them. And this, I think this is kind of fun, actually, and it's worked out really well. I had a, I had a Jehovah's Witness on the radio with me, a uh, well-known Jehovah's Witness, and uh, I, I pulled this on him uh, to uh, some great success, as, as a matter of fact. I said, now, can you think of any time in the English language where we say something is only true, or in any language where we say uh, something, there's only one true in that category without it making everything else false. Uh, Do you understand? One true blank, and I'd say fill in the blank. Fill in anything else that you can think of, anything else. Give me any other examples It doesn't matter what area, what arena of thought you were talking about. Give me something else. There is one true blank. Fill that in where it doesn't make everything else in that category false. 
And I've pushed this and push it and push it nicely, but I push it and push it. See, because that's the way it works, right? If there's only one true something, then everything else in that category is false. And so, the, and one of their favorite verses is, and this is a verse they'll quote right away, is John 17, 3, which in the New World Translation reads like this. Uh, this means everlasting life. They're taking in the knowledge of you, the only true God, and the of the one whom you sent forth, Jesus Christ. And they'll say, see, Jehovah is the only true God. And I'll say, you, right, but you've already admitted that Jesus was also a God, so then he must be a false God. But you've already said that Jesus was a true God, so that doesn't, how do you explain that? Well, of course, they can't explain that. And I'll keep going back, count them, two true gods, but this says that they would know you, the only true God. That means everything else in the category of God must be a false God, or that verse just isn't true. And uh, the scripture says uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 4 through 6, there is no God but one, for even though there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, just as there are many gods and many lords, there's actually for us one God, the Father, out of whom all things are, and we for him, and there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things are, and we through him. It sounds a little stilted because I'm reading again from the New World Translation, but notice it says there's no God but one. Well, again, and they will bring the scripture up, but you've already admitted you have, you've, in your way of thinking, there's at least two true gods. How do you reconcile this? And of course, they're trying to say the Father is God, not Jesus, but of course, they've already admitted that Jesus is a true God. And then now they'll say, uh, usually sooner or later it'll get to, well, you're talking about the Trinity, are you? Aren't you? You're talking, you're talking about the Trinity. You're trying to tell, teach me about the Trinity. And I'll say, I'm not talking about the Trinity. I'm talking about the fact that Jehovah's Witnesses are polytheists. And you don't want to be a polytheist. You reject the idea of being polytheist, but indeed you believe in a universe where there's more than one true God. And this is a, then comes this strange point. They'll say, well, we didn't come here to argue. And I'll sit there and say, immediately I think, you didn't come here to argue and I'm applying for Pope. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's ridiculous. In fact, the, the first time I heard that line, I laughed so hard I kicked the slats out of my crib. But it is interesting it is interesting, isn't it, to have, have them all of a sudden, well, we didn't come here to argue. And I'll go, you know, they're beginning to back out of this. They're beginning to walk away. And I'll say, is it because you didn't come here to argue or because you can't answer my question? And I've had them go, all right, we'll stay. I'll say, now, but we're still on the same question. And they'll start, as the conversation goes on, they'll say, well, uh, what, what about this or what about that? No, 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 no. You haven't answered my question yet. I want you to reconcile how you can believe there's two true gods in the universe, but you only worship one of these true gods. I'd like, please, reconcile this for me. And of course, uh, they are getting, by this time, very nervous and start looking at the door and trying to, trying to get out. And I say, when they say, I don't, well, we didn't want to come here to argue. I said, well, maybe somebody else in your kingdom hall, in your local kingdom hall, has the answer to this. Why don't you bring them back next week and we can discuss it together? They've never come back. I've said that to them. They never come back. Uh, they only come back if they think that they're going to beat you in the argument. And by the way, and this is not a good thing, but most of the time, this, one of the advantages of using a method like this is most of the time, frankly, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses think that Christians are idiots. They think they're just blithering idiots, as a matter of fact. And the reason they think Christians are blithering idiots is because they talk to them every time they go out Door to door, they're always there, and they talk to them every single time. And when they talk to many of these Christians, not only can the Christian not defend Christian doctrine in any way, shape, or form, they cannot defend Christian doctrine, not only can they not defend it, they can't even articulate correctly what their own doctrine is. And sometimes Jehovah's Witnesses will actually find themselves telling Christians what true Christian doctrine really is, because the Christian can't articulate it himself. So the Jehovah's Witness is walking around thinking, wow, we are just so much more aware of Scripture. We are so much smarter. There's, every time we ask them a question, not only can, or the average Christian a question, not only can they not articulate an intelligent answer, they, they, they can't even get their own doctrine straight. They can't even state their own doctrine and what they truly believe about things. Well, that's not good. So... 
This does several things for me, this line of reasoning. Um, one, as I said, and I wanna mention again, it keeps me from having, or it keeps you, I'm pretty well versed in Jehovah's Witness doctrine, I do apologetics full time, but it keeps you from having to know every possible doctrine, like you don't really wanna get into a, a discussion with Jehovah's Witnesses on soul sleep versus eternal punishment, uh, unless you're really well versed on that, they're going to clock you, because I've been in their kingdom hall meetings, and they are training their people to go out and argue with you, frankly. That's what they train their people to do, to go out and argue with you, and they find that most Christians are pushovers. And so if you have one approach, you'll find that this helps you in dealing with you and give, get with them and giving you something intelligent to say. The other thing, another thing that it does is, uh, is it all of a sudden they go, wow, there are, some, there are some smart Christians out there that can go toe to toe with me. There really are, and I think that's great all of itself. Don't you? Don't you think it's wonderful that every once in a while at least, a Jehovah's Witness is going to run into a, a Christian where they go, I can't answer their questions. And the fact that I don't let them ask another question, by the way, I want them to walk away going <sighs> and thinking, we couldn't answer his question. By the way, uh, I found, found this so successful. One, one woman, I, I was, when I was in secular employment many years ago, I knew there was a Jehovah's Witness and I wrote to her one day and I said, let me, can I ask you a question? And she says, sure. And uh, uh, so I be, did just exactly what I've done with you. And uh, after we did this for about six months, but I kept going back to fill in the blank can you find any, any word you want, put it in there. I know she was going back to her kingdom hall and saying, how do I answer this guy? I have no doubt, but she, she just simply couldn't answer me at all, and I just kept, I was, well, frankly, rather relentless, uh, and one day she finally came up past me in the hall, and she says, you just like to go around and destroy other people's religions. And I thought, well, no, well, yes, I do, actually. What am I saying? Of course, of course I like to destroy other people's religions. I, every, every other religion is false. Um, if Christianity is true, then every other religion is false. And yes, I didn't put it that way to her, of course, but you'll notice that she just simply was crumpling under the weight of the argument. Another thing that this does, that this line of reasoning does, is it's actually very sneaky. When they say you're talking about the Trinity, I do, I do, uh, push that off and say, no, no, right now I'm only talking about uh, the fact that you're a polytheist, but, but think about this, this is the logic, the, this, these underlying questions are the logic of the Trinity. Simply put, if there, are, if there is only one God, if there is only one God, and if there are three people in the Bible called God, then the three people must be the one God. And of course, Jehovah's Witnesses have just simply said, this is just, pagan, this is just pagan doctrine, but notice that their views have led to contradiction that they simply cannot answer. And I'm waiting to have an answer today. It hasn't happened yet. Because there is no answer, right? And this does then set up the idea for the Trinity. So I'm actually accomplishing that by just pointing out that their view leads to, pantheism, or to polytheism, I am accomplishing, encouraging them to rethink the Trinity. Finally, uh, and of course related to this, they think that the Trinity is a pagan doctrine. But to show them, to give them some reason to believe that it's not a pagan doctrine, that there's good reason to hold this, I think we've accomplished quite a bit to keep doing this. Also, this, this doing this kind of approach keeps them from playing what I call scripture hit and run. And we do this with, every, every religion does this, every belief system, atheists do that. What they do is, they will hit you with your, their best shot, hit you with their best shot, and when you, they see that you can answer it, what do they do? When they see that you're gaining traction in answering their best shot, what do they do? They go to the next subject. And in my young years, I, I, we just, keep changing subjects because as soon as they realized that I'd gained traction in a particular point, they just switch subjects. With this, and, and I, by the way, I don't just do this with Jehovah's Witnesses. I do this with Mormons. I do this with atheists. I do this with anyone I'm debating with. Uh, I debated this gal on uh, whether or not uh, Jesus was a real person. My, that blog's entitled, Je Jesus isn't a real person, question mark. That's dumb. I have created blog titles. But 
this one woman went around and around with me and I just simply wouldn't let her go until she finally went, okay, she says, at the end of the blog, and you know this is good, she says, okay, tell everybody you won, Dr. Jones, and that was, I never heard from her again. Well, okay, good. At least we've established that Jesus was a real person. We've accomplished something. So don't let people, so just in general, not just with Jehovah's Witnesses, if you've got an important point to make, do not allow the person you're talking to change the subject until they've either agreed with you or they've just simply left. Because there's just no point in it. Uh, I argued, uh, debated with a, a Buddhist for quite some time. Before we even began, I said, I said, look, before we begin, we have to agree the contrary, uh, the contrary statements cannot be true. Buddhists think the contrary statements can be true. I said, contrary statements cannot be true. And until you agree with that, I'm not going to argue any further. And she'd want to bring up this or that or the other thing. I'd say, no, 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 no. We have to agree. Because what's the point? You can say uh, that abortion is right, which she thought it was. Uh, and I can say abortion is wrong, but if contradictory statements can be true, then we're both right and both wrong at the same time and in the same way. So what's the point of moving on any further? Finally, she says, okay, fine. Contradictory statements can't be true. But that's, frankly, that means you just gave up Buddhism. You understand? So I really do, I really do encourage you in any kind of argument, whether it's with a Jehovah's Witness or anyone else, to stick to your guns. If you've got an important point, they either need to convince you that you're wrong or, you ne or they need to agree with you that you're right. Otherwise, don't leave it. Don't allow people to quit, uh, keep switching the subject on you. Finally, what does all this come out to be? We need to be studied, prayerful, and I do mean on our knees prayerful, people who can articulate arguments. This is like chess for me, by the way. I love computer chess, and I, I used to like playing people, but I find the computer does a good job, and I can take a move back if I get trapped. But <laughs> well, one of the things that I learned is, you know, if, to be a master in computer, and I'm a, here's my analogy for the cults, to be a master uh, in, in chess, you have to know, basically memorize all the openings. You know the strengths and weaknesses of every chess opening. The Nimzo Indian, you know uh, the Queen's Gambit, except the Queen's Gambit declined. You know the in Nimzo Indian defense. You know all this stuff, right? You know how they all work. Well, I'm never gonna be a master, so I thought I'm just gonna learn Queen's Gambit, which is a powerful opening, and I thought I'm gonna study every aspect of Queen's Gambit, and as long as I get to play white, whoa, the other guy's in trouble, the <laughs> average player, because they're not used to it. What I, now, what I'm saying, of course, is if you learn a good approach with the cults, keep, just keep using it. And by the way, they're coming to your door. You're not seeking them out. So I think you have every right to say, okay, you've come to my door. Answer my question first. If you successfully answer my question, I'll answer any question you want. They're never going to answer this question because it is at the heart of the Trinity. It shows them to be polytheists. It's never going to work. And so the scripture says... In Titus chapter 2, 13, we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's right. We wait for our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let, uh, one more mention. Clay, if you can get all of this again, look up a question Jehovah's Witnesses can't answer under claydjones.net, and all of this will be here so that you didn't have to write furiously, which I don't think anybody was in the mood to do anyway. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.